Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Uma. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, I would like to uh, give a detailed overview and presentation about Apache Ozone Eraser Coding, how we built uh, uh, this feature in Apache Ozone. Um, which is basically Apache Ozone is a, uh, a big data uh, object store. Uh, and uh, which say basically with this uh, eraser coding, we, uh, we, we would be able to save almost like 50% storage space uh, compared to any other uh, traditional three-way replication uh, storage softwares. So just before jumping a uh, uh, little bit about me, I am a principal software engineer at uh, Cloudera, and uh, uh, I'm also a Apache Software Foundation member. Uh, and uh, uh, um, Apache Hadoop Project Management Committee and uh, uh, several other projects like Ozone and Ratis, uh, a few more other projects. And also I am uh, part of uh, Incubator Project Management Committee member uh, where we get a chance to review the new projects into the Apache. Um, and I, I mentored several projects uh, which entered into the Apache. And I also uh, served as a big data track chair for the last two years. Uh, what is Ozone? Right? It's, which is a distributed, scalable, high performance object storage, uh, which we built from the scratch, and uh, which is designed um, uh, primarily optimized for uh, big data workloads. And it can scale up to billions of objects. Uh, and uh, it can effectively work with containerized environments like uh, Yarn and Kubernetes, um, which is strongly consistent from the initial design itself. We consider this fact because we wanted to take the HDFS uh, uh, use cases uh, as a primary uh, use cases for us. Uh, and as well as we want to support object store semantics uh, so, and it can scale up to thousands of nodes, uh, uh, and it, it works seamlessly with uh, any of the big data uh, stack frameworks like uh, Spark, Hive, and uh, Yarn. Um, and we choose just basically uh, many of these uh, big data uh, uh, applications use um, file system protocol, which primarily built with uh, HDFS. Uh, so, we, we provided the same interface uh, with Ozone as well. So a little bit about uh, uh, ozone architecture before uh, jumping onto the EC, uh, EC architecture. So ozone architecture, if you look at, uh, there are a um, uh, few different components inside. So one is ozone manager, which serves as like a namespace management. And uh, uh, next component is storage container management. Here the container is not uh, uh, as like a cloud uh, or Docker container, which is a logical batch of blocks. Uh, so uh, the logical, each logical batch will have a separate ID. We call it as a container ID. So only the container IDs would be reported to the container manager. So container manager takes care of the life cycle of that containers uh, and their health. Uh, and the data node stores the containers. And um, inside the container, each individual block is a OS file. Um, so each block will have its own ID along with the container ID. So they all group together in inside a data node uh, as a container. We call it as a container, which is a separate folder. So, and we have additional component which provides uh, additional uh, uh, metrics details, uh, how the cluster health and how the container um, container health and all these details, uh, which is a recon server. And uh, from the API perspective, we have a Java-based uh, uh, client. And uh, then uh, shell-based client, which is uh, usually helpful for the developers. Um, and we have file system interfaces, um, uh, as I said before. Um, like a, 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 any, if anybody is able to use the HDFS or uh, big data file system interfaces, they should be able to seamlessly work with Ozone. And we have uh, S3 interface as well. Like uh, if applications work with uh, Amazon S3 or any other S3 compatible protocol, they all should work uh, seamlessly with this Ozone because we provided the similar interface. So if you look a little deep inside how the write flow works, which is uh, first when you're writing a key, the, the client uh, requests to the Ozone manager, which uh, creates an entry. 
and then as well as it asks a storage container manager to get the uh, actual uh, block locations, which are the good nodes uh, right now available. So it picks uh, some of the good nodes and based on the replication factor. So it returns back to the um, client via Ozone Manager. So then client directly talks to the respective data nodes, what addresses we got from SEM. Because SEM in touch with all the data nodes, that all data nodes would report their health to the SEM uh, frequently. So the SEM knows which are all uh, available. Uh, so then, then the physical um, actual data blocks would store um, would be stored inside the data nodes. As I said, uh, they would be sec uh, separated into the containers, separated folders. Um, and then at the end, we do a commit key, which uh, client tracks all the data which was committed to the uh, data nodes. So that would be up updated to the Ozone Manager. So Ozone Manager uh, stores uh, all the uh, meta information. So um, yeah, uh, coming to the eraser coding. So so I, I'm not I haven't discussed about the read flow, which is read flow is pretty much similar. Then it requests the ozone manager what are the locations because it stored the location information, so and it can give back to the clients and clients directly talk to the data nodes and they can just read back. So eraser coding requirements are basically uh, we separated into three milestones while we are developing. Uh, like basically we sh uh, we should support enabling at the bucket level because the ozone is uh, 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 natively built as uh, object store. Uh, so which is which is have the notion of buckets and uh, 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 keys. So each bucket level, we should be able to enable the eraser coding. So if we enable on a bucket, so all the files, whatever you, you write on inside a bucket should be eraser coded. And we should be able to enable at the cluster level also. If somebody don't want to enable at each bucket level, so they can just enable at a whole cluster level. Um, and uh, implicitly, we got at uh, key level also, we should be able to enable. Uh, then um, the obviously the write files and read files should be should be in the EC format and the, the different scheme protocols we want to support which is uh, three two and six three and ten four, uh, which is nothing but like uh, three are data pieces and uh, two are uh, parity. Uh, in the second case, like uh, six are data pieces and uh, three are parity, and the third one is similar ten data and four uh, parity. All these three uh, all these three uh, uh, different schemes we are supporting. Uh, and uh, uh, the online recovery, let's say uh, when you're reading, one of the data nodes is like not available or crashed. So we should be able to uh, automatically, transparently, we should be able to recover the data back and uh, serve to the uh, users. So uh, that's that's one feature we considered. And uh, as is phase two, we want to do offline recovery. Offline recovery, I would explain in detail later what it is. So offline recovery is uh, in, in brief, uh, if any of the node is permanently lost, like let's say one of the disk is completely gone. So then um, that particular containers, we should be able to re recover back um, uh, as a permanent basis, right? So there, there will be a back, background process which would uh, keep track of them and uh, it should be able to recover by using existing replicas. So as a phase three, we want to pro improve the more usability perspective like uh, ease of like use. So people should be able to enable this uh, uh, easy options through recon or uh, uh, CM. Uh, and uh, then we should be able to provide the options to convert the data. So which is already like, a, let's say in three way mode. So we should, uh, in place, we should convert the data to the uh, eraser coding mode. So, so uh, uh, jumping on to the EC architecture, so there are a few terms to uh, note here. Uh, we I, I may keep uses container group and uh, block group. So I just want to tell what it is. So container group is nothing but a, a batch of containers uh, which would be physically created in the data nodes. So it is just nothing but a same same container ID, but uh, they will be diff uh, they will be created in a different data nodes. Uh, they're not exact identical replicas, like in uh, three, uh, replication modes. They, are, they will have a different data, but the IDs will be same. Uh, the block group is same, the, in the same container. So uh, inside the container, if you look at, they will be physical files. Uh, they, they, we call them as a blocks. So the blocks will be created inside the containers. So once I show the picture, uh, that would make it clear. And uh, 
each data plus parity. I said the numbers uh, 3, 2, and 6, 3, uh, they are the data plus parity, right? So the chunks would be written into this block group. So let's say if you have 3, 2, then we would create five blocks uh, into the five containers. So all this data from the client uh, would be spanned into these uh, five data nodes in parallel. So the parity generation happens at the client while writing. So this picture should give a little bit uh, uh, in details how the data layout. Uh, so let's say uh, the client, in, our input file is something like this. So then uh, first 256 MB when we are started writing. So it's actually writes in a chunk by chunk, but here this picture I am showing as a full block. So the first block, um, it placed at the uh, container, container one. Uh, the same container would be created in all these five nodes, but however, the data should be different because in EC, there is no duplicate data. So we want to avoid that uh, duplication here. Uh, instead, we generate a parity. So the data, the first block would be stored in uh, N1, and the second one would be in N2, and third one would be N3. But the data layout is not contiguous, which, which would go in a, like a stripe by stripe in the next picture I would show. Uh, we because we want to support uh, the files, small files as well. We cannot wait until file size reaches 256 MB to finish writing to the N1. So each chunk, is, which is a 1 MB, each 1 MB would be uh, like, we write in a round robin fashion to all these three data nodes. And then once the stripe, data stripe is finished, let's say until 3 MB, if I finish, then I would go and generate the parity. The parity data pieces would go into N4 and N5. So in that round robin fashion, I will complete until uh, three blocks. Uh, so once the three blocks finished fully, then we are ready to close the block group. So we close this block group and uh, the next uh, set of data uh, would request another block group from the OM. And uh, then it, the, let's say in this, in this example, I, it, it got like a container ID uh, 33 and the blocks again B6 and uh, B9, two blocks we got uh, for the, the next set of uh, three sets. So when a uh, node, node fails, uh, block group will be closed. There, there are few details, like when, uh, when writing any of the uh, node fails, let's say, then we close the current block group and we rewrite that stripe, the failed stripe data into the new block group. Um, and SEM, SEM manages the pipeline creation based on the replication factor. We have three different type of schemes we are supporting, right? So how many nodes we have to select? Uh, from the available node set, right? That will be passed from the client, uh, the replication factor, which is uh, 3, 2, or uh, 6, 3, or 10, 4. So based on that, uh, the SEM storage container manager would, would know how many nodes should be selected for the uh, client to write. Uh, in Ozone, uh, the traditional three-way replication uh, was used heavily the RATIS. It depends on the RATIS to do the replication. So in EC path, we avoided using completely RATIS um, because we client manages all the uh, transferring uh, data and coordinating the data here. So this is this is a picture we'll show like little zoom inside. Uh, inside the block layout. So let's say we take a first block itself. Uh, so the first chunk, uh, we call this horizontal piece as a stripe, uh, considering uh, uh, the chunk one, chunk two, chunk three, and uh, the parity ones, all this together horizontally, we call it as a stripe. Uh, <coughs> and when, when, when we finish the first three chunks, uh, we generate the parity one and parity two, that would be transferred to the node four and node five. Then the next one MB, the fourth chunk would go into the N1 again, uh, which I was saying like round robin fashion. So we complete until the 256 MB, each uh, uh, block finishes the 256 MB, we, com uh, we continue this rotation. Uh, so once we finish the 256 MB sizes of each block, then we are ready to close the block group. So how we identify uh, because if you look at this block and container, they are, their names are same, right? So how we identify the positions, uh, which position on which da uh, what data we have written in which position, right? So to identify that, we have additional field, which is called a replica index, which is very important field, which would tell us like which particular replica is lost in the eraser group. Uh, so that only for that uh, last replica, we want to recover back. 
by using eraser decoding function later. So in case if there are any failures. <coughs> which is a, uh, here uh, I already introduced the, what is a stripe, which is stripe is like a horizontal uh, uh, piece of one MB chunk size. So in, e in each node one round, if you finish, we call that as a stripe. And uh, some chunks would be written into the round robin fashion and uh, pa parity generation happens at the client. Uh, this is just a re recapping of that picture. Uh, what we have uh, explained. Okay, here, um, which is a, there is one more important uh, uh, factor, which is like a padding. Uh, let's say uh, your file is just one MB size. So, uh, so I, we don't need to write the data into the second node and third node, even though we choose in the five nodes uh, as a block group. So we, we don't really need to write the second node and third node because your file size is just one MB, right? So one M, chunk size is one MB. One MB will return the first file itself, uh, first block itself. Then we use the padding data, which is just in-memory assumption of like uh, with all zeros content, and we generate the uh, parity with that. But we don't write any data because length should tell us uh, whether the second and third block exist or not. So let's say our, my length is just one MB, then I know that uh, second and third block is not uh, no more required to uh, reconstruct. Uh, so even though it has a three replicas available uh, so, uh, as opposed to five, uh, we don't need to reconstruct anything because the length is just one MB. But we still need a parity uh, to recover back. Let's say first block itself lost, then we need uh, the parity replicas to reconstruct back. So we can assume like N1 and N2 and N3 as padding data, but at least we need uh, uh, one more replica, from either from N4 or N N5. So to reconstruct back, we need at least the data number of pieces, uh, either uh, either from the parity or data, uh, any, any uh, data number of pieces required. In, in th this picture assumes a uh, three two scheme, which is that's why we are cho I'm showing all these pictures with five, uh, five nodes. So in three two scheme, let's say uh, no n one lost, then I I just need three piece three pieces any of this uh, remaining pieces to reconstruct the n one back. So I would jump onto the uh, EC read flow. Um, read should make sure uh, the order should be the same, right? Uh, because it, it, it has uh, written in the round robin fashion, we should read in the same order uh, in which fashion we have written. So the read will ensure that uh, it, is, it is reading in the same order and uh, transparently it stitches the pieces back and uh, serve to the client. And uh, and this uh, this is the picture shows how uh, the read order. So the first first the reader would open the streams to n1, n2, n3, uh, and uh, first one MB it, it reads from the n1, and then it goes to the next stream. Uh, it reads n2, and then and so on. Um, one point to note here is we don't need to read from n4 and n5 because they are just a parity until unless it's required we don't need to go to them right uh, that, because that's not actual data. Uh, which is just a parity data, uh, which was which is required for the reconstruction uh, in case if any of N1, N2, N3 uh, data blocks lost. So let's, <coughs> yeah. So let's uh, uh, let's take that case as well in this example. Let's say in N3 uh, we lost the block from N3, then. Then this is the re reconstructional read. Uh, it should transparently reconstruct the data uh, and serve back to the clients, right? So what it does is like when it is attempting to read N3, uh, it figures out that there is no, no, node is not available, right? So in this case, what it does is it will switch to the online recovery mode and it goes to N1, N, N4 or N5 and gets that 1MB chunk from that node and uh, it does the EC reconstruction. Um, EC it, it invokes the DC decode, in, in, it invokes the decode function and gets the erased index, which is N3, back. So, and uh, 
which, which all happens at the Ozone client, client library itself. Uh, so user would, uh, would not be aware of this one. So, but there will be slight impact of the reconstruction overhead because it has to read the additional replica to the um, uh, uh, client node and it has to do the reconstruction. Which is not really additional. At the first step, uh, at the first failure, it would uh, uh, it, it has to attempt to the N3 and then has to go to the N4. And from next onwards, it has to go to the N4 and get all the uh, chunks. Uh, but however, it has to use some C additional CPU to do the compute or uh, reconstruction. <laughs> so uh, the next topic is uh, offline recovery, uh, which we uh, which we talked uh, in brief. Uh, offline recovery is like uh, when permanently we lost any node or a disk, right? So these are the very common failures. So if there is a failure like that, so then we have we should have a way to uh, reconstruct the data automatically in the background, so that the next clients need not really do the online reconstruction, which is a uh, little inefficient, right? So to avoid that one, so we need a offline offline reconstruction. So which is uh, simply a background process, which is similar to the replication monitors in the uh, uh, distributed softwares. Uh, which is back in the in the background it tracks keep track of the container health uh, in case if any of the containers are uh, uh, not available then it it it, it goes to the uh, reconstruction uh, flow and it 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 does the reconstruction we will discuss how the reconstruction happens Yeah, the replication monitor is a, uh, one of the uh, key component in uh, storage container manager, which keeps track of the health of each container. Uh, so in the same replication monitor uh, schedules the replications in the RATIS mode, I mean three-way replication mode, which is an identical copy, which would just download from any other uh, node, a healthy node, and uh, uh, which, which, which is just a copy of the um, data from other, because it has, we have a duplicate data in the uh, three-way mode, right? Uh, replication mode. But in EC case, which is a little tricky, because there is nowhere the data, exact data is available. We have to reconstruct the back uh, using other pieces. So we have to, the, the, this is a, compared to the simple copy of the replication, which is a little heavier than um, the re simple replication. So this is the high level flow, how uh, we schedule the uh, reconstruction. So SEM first detects a storage container manager, which is managing the, all the containers, container health uh, from the data node reports. So which is basically keeps track of uh, the container health, right? So once it figured out the, what are the replica indexes are missing. So let's say uh, when it gets the report from the DN1, DN2, DN3, and DN4 and 5 are missing the containers. So it didn't report. So then SCM figures out that uh, it's supposed to get the container reports from DN4 and DN5, but uh, there are no report available for this container, then that means it's a missing replica. So then it schedules, uh, it figures out what are the other good nodes in the cluster. So let's say it picks out DN6 and DN7 in this case, and um, prepare a command to uh, prepare a command for the reconstruction, uh, what are the information required, let's say, what are the source replicas available, uh, which are DN1, DN2, DN3 are available in this case, and what are the new targets, uh, which are which should be DN6 and DN7, uh, pardon me, like DN4 and DN5 I put here, which is a DN6 and DN7, um, they, are the they should be the new targets, and uh, the missing indexes, which are four and five, uh, right? So then with this information, the task could be scheduled to one of the target, which is, a, let's say in this case, a DN6 as a target. The DN6 responsibility to reconstruct is that it has to read the data from DN1, DN2, DN3. DN means data node here, right? So which has to read the data from all these three nodes, and it has to go through that EC reconstruction flow, and 
then uh, then it has to write the newly recovered container data to the dn6 and dn7 so all of this process happens at the dn6 and once that is done um, before creating actually we create this container set as a def, uh, separate state which is called a recovery state uh, so that we, this container would not be reported to the sem so uh, because this this is a in progress container right so uh, we don't want to report this in progress container details to the scm um, because which is a which could be a partial right so once it is fully done uh, reconstruction then we close that container as part of a close we make it as a uh, healthy state so then the healthy state container will be reported back to the storage container manager and it accepts a containers from dn6 and dn7 it it completely ignores the dn4 and dn5 uh, uh, in future it goes as a or replication in case even dn4 and dn5 comes back so uh, there are uh, several schemes we are supporting uh, which is um, uh, read solomon based uh, eraser coding and uh, uh, xr based eraser coding so the schemes are 3, 2, 6, 3, 10, 4, as I said. And the last part is uh, chunk size. Uh, that is a configurable. Users can decide how much size they want to write into each node in this round robin fashion, um, the smaller unit. So this is a little bit about how we could enable uh, uh, the cluster level EC. Uh, how we could enable at the cluster level EC. Uh, the, once we, this, these are the default configurations. If we configure this, uh, these parameters in the cluster, so they would be used as a cluster level configurations. Um, the pri I would explain the priority, how it uh, respects this configuration uh, against the bucket level, if somebody configures at bucket level. So how, uh, at the time of creation, uh, bucket creation, we could pass this replication options so that the, it sets on the bucket. Uh, so we just need to pass the type, what is the EC or RATIS and uh, the replication. Uh, in RATIS mode, it will be just three or one. Uh, in eraser coding mode, we could pass six, three or three, two or whatever scheme we want, we could pass so that all the keys under that bucket would be, uh, would be eraser coded with this scheme. Uh, once, let's say, once you created a bucket with uh, once, once one particular scheme and uh, you decided to change the scheme later, so uh, we, we provide that option as well, so that uh, from the time you change, um, the new keys would be uh, take effect with this new configuration. So we have an option to, uh, even at a key level, when you want to create at key level different replication config, let's say one of the key you want to go with different type. So we provided even that option as well. So you just need to pass that option while creating a key. So the options would be respected in this order. Like if the client is specifying some value, we uh, respect that value and uh, it takes that parameter as a high reference. And if client is not passing anything, then uh, it goes and check the what is what is the replication option set on the bucket. So then it takes that as a reference. If n nothing set on the bucket, then it takes the global uh, configuration which I showed in the parameters configuration, right? So the file system clients, uh, which is a easy bucket config, uh, would take. Uh, because in the file system kinds, there is one tricky part is that uh, the API was designed in such a way that we could only pass number. Uh, so you, we cannot express the EC configuration in the uh, in a single number because it has a two parameters, parity and data. So um, uh, for S3 clients, if somebody sets uh, on the bucket, so the all the bucket uh, uh, written keys would be always key, EC keys. Uh, because um, EC, EC options would not be able to, we, we would not be able to specify EC options from the client. Then if bucket is not having any EC options, then uh, obviously we respect the client passed values, then, then it goes to the cluster. Uh, as I said, like S3 
Uh, FS and S3, both the clients would use the bucket level EC um, because we don't have a provision to pass uh, at the key level, which is a single number I said. So we, uh, we can only pass the single number uh, from the APA design. Uh, from S3, there's a storage class options we can specify, but there is no EC storage class option available from the client perspective. So uh, one could go and set on the bucket. So then um, all the keys, whatever we, we write under the bucket would be uh, EC'd uh, for the S3 clients. So the current status wise, uh, where we are on the CC uh, development. So we have finished uh, this feature like up to the phase three. So offline reconstruction and what have pretty much we, I explained, uh, all of these uh, uh, provisions are available today in the Apache Ozone, uh, which is committed in the upstream. Uh, the phase three is in progress. So we have taken that as um, uh, roadmap task. Uh, and also we wanted to provide additional schemes uh, uh, once we test uh, in detail, like uh, uh, some of the customers are requesting, even they wanted to go with 12.4 uh, 12, uh, 12 mode. Uh, so uh, for the very cold data, they don't, uh, they want like a larger uh, 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 storage savings. So the, the more you go, the savings will be more. How the, the, um, the difficult part is like a reconstruction time. It has to read more replicas back to reconstruct. So uh, that is a trade-off uh, based on the use case users have to decide. Some of that stats like uh, uh, on which JIRAs we worked in Apache, uh, it's like more than 200 JIRAs we worked for this feature uh, and still in progress uh, with the um, issues what we have currently uh, and planned. So uh, some acknowledgements to the developers who uh, really um, put their hard efforts into this feature and a lot of uh, folks um, helped to review. Yeah, we, <clears throat> this is the Git repo of Apache Ozone, uh, which is a, a open source project. Uh, uh, if any of you are not aware of this one, uh, which was built from the scratch and uh, the primarily we wanted to support all the HDFS use cases plus S3 uh, API use cases. That was the motivation for this project. Uh, and if one wants to contribute, then these are the uh, resources uh, to help with the project. Yeah, uh, I got more than 15 minutes for Q and A. Yes, so uh, one thing we did was uh, uh, we, we have written uh, as, as part of the last put block, we do write the length, length of the uh, block. So the right after uh, sharing this coordination task to the uh, DN, DN would say that this block uh, is not required to reconstruct. The, however, uh, the blocks are part of the a big container, right? So within the container, there could be several other blocks. So the, the scheduling still happens, but the reconstruction would not happen this, for this uh, uh, padded, padded blocks because the length is written part of the block. So when I realize that this length is just one MB, so that means I know that there is just, just only one block. So what is the current last indexes are uh, actually? So the last indexes are let's say two and three, then uh, we don't need to recover anything from that uh, uh, no, for that nodes. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So 
So until uh, for each client could get a different container group. It is not a fix for all the clients. So uh, it's depending on how many open containers we have uh, in the cluster. It could give the same container or different container. Let's say all the other containers are in use with other uh, clients. Then it could get a different container depending on the uh, availability. So, but the once the client is uh, assigned, then the client would continue to write to the same block group until it finishes the 256 MB size of the block. So once it finishes, it again requests to the OM, then it could get the different uh, container group. Yeah, so within a container, uh, for a container, we dedicate uh, uh, the parity nodes uh, so you could have a question that why the, that is we are not reading the from that container nodes, right? Uh, but the thing is that it it could distribute well distributed with the different containers. So these two nodes could be assigned with other data uh, data blocks for the other containers, right? Correct, correct. So we have a replication index which is exactly maps that uh, in which order we have written the data so based on that replica index we figured out like which position of data we have to reconstruct okay that's a good question actually in hdfs if you are aware of a little bit about that architecture we have a bottleneck of block reporting let's say uh, at the name node we need to figure out which blocks are available which blocks are not right so they keep send the block reports. Let's say after uh, the data nodes, like let's say um, 100 TB, more than 100 TB, then they may have a huge number of blocks and that block processing really becoming heavy in the name node. So whoever has the data nodes, which are more than like 100 uh, TB data, so they all suffers uh, this block processing uh, times. So we wanted to avoid that uh, bulk block processing. So then in Ozone, we, we, we had came up with a concept called containers, which is container is a uh, group of blocks. So each data node reports only container health. Uh, now the replication unit became a big container instead of the each block. So the since the data node is reporting only container, uh, uh, it do it, it's no more reporting the each individual block ID. So it's like a, a container size is almost like five gig size we can configure. So it reduced uh, significantly the block reporting cost reduced. So that, that opens up another uh, uh, use case for ozone is that uh, we could have a dense storage. Uh, like a, in HDFS, that's a big bottleneck. In, we cannot have a dense storage which is having uh, hundreds of TBs uh, of storage size because they have to report their blocks back to the name node. But here we tested up to 400 TB and uh, Cloudera certified and which is uh, working very well. And uh, we we still continuing to do testing with more dense nodes. Uh, we are partnering with some of our uh, uh, customers and doing this testing. Yeah, you have. Yeah, a yeah, container group uh, is basically fixed uh, based on the scheme, uh, which is independent of the file size. So once you select this one, uh, the container group, then the files would split based on the chunk size, which we pass. So how much size you have, it would just rotate among that group. Let's say you have 10, four then the each 1 MB would be split like until 10 MB would be one stripe would be written to all the 10 nodes and then, then 11th MB will come back and write that. That way until the, your file is finished, it, it, it keep on go in a round robin fashion. So it, the container group is nothing to do with the file size. So you could optimally choose um, the, con the eraser coding schemes. For example, your files are just a 3 MB or 4 MB range. It could be optimal for you to choose 3.2 instead of uh, 
uh, like 10, if you put, like, there is a lot of padding we are doing, right? Instead, we could choose three, two. So that's why we are uh, trying to provide like different schemes, which may be depending on the use case, users could choose which is best for them. Yeah, uh, the RATIS is a kind of consensus protocol, right? Uh, which we use for uh, the replication uh, of the data, as well as the, uh, the Ozone Manager uses to replicate its metadata, and as well as Storage Container Manager uses to replicate its metadata. And uh, even Data Nodes uses to replicate their data uh, into three replicas. So in EC mode, uh, we are not using that uh, RATIS. So because the client completely takes care of coordinating the data uh, which stri uh, based on the Stripe. If Stripe fails, uh, either uh, Stripe pass or fail, uh, right? So if any node fails, uh, we consider that Stripe has failed and we abandon that uh, Stripe and we close the block group until just the previous Stripe. And then we rewrite this failed Stripe back to the new block group once we choose it. So based on the lengths, um, the, each, as part of each chunk, we also update what is the current length so what is the minimum available in this uh, uh, stripe? Uh, that length would be considered as a, a committed length at the time of reconstruction. Because you could have a question that um, what happens like in a, some of the other stripes we would have succeeded to write, but others one, only just one node is failed. So that nodes would have additional data compared to the, this node, right, failed node. So which is the correct length? So we, the correct length is the minimum of available. That should be the correct length, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good question. Actually, we we did evaluate uh, some of the things uh, based on our customer usages. The lot of our customers are with uh, HDFS. Uh, and a lot of these uh, big data workloads working well with HDFS, so which is not the case for uh, Ceph uh, in many cases. So then we decided that we wanted to support the same HDFS use cases as it is seamlessly for the, all the big data workloads. Uh, so, and as well as the scaling part, uh, we have around uh, uh, couple of hundred petabytes of data in the clusters, so which may not be the case for Ceph, we haven't heard much on the scaling wise. So, so th that they are the key motivations we went ahead with this Ozone, and as well as we want to support with uh, with this S3 use cases as well. Uh, even though Ceph has, uh, we thought of like, uh, let's say the renames of uh, object store semantics may be a little tough, because they don't have a notion of a directory, right? So they had to, uh, we have built a rename uh, by having a directory prefixes, which is very fast, which is, which is pretty much equal to the file system's rename, directory rename. So they, we, we want to have such flexibility to handle our own uh, um, scenarios based on the customer's um, expectations. Any other questions? Or... If no other questions, I thank thanks a lot uh, for coming. Yeah, thank you.